Okay, great. Uh, I'm sorry. I apologize to those of you who have been waiting uh, around. We've had some tech issues as we do with um, a lot of these remote conferences, but we're going to just go ahead and get started as we await others to join us here on this panel. Um, my name is Akiko Fujita. I'm an anchor and reporter with Yahoo Finance and uh, very excited today to be hosting this panel on corporate leadership post-COVID. I'm going to get right into it because we've certainly got a pretty packed panel as we get other of our panelists to start joining. Um, let me introduce who we have here so far. We've got Francis Govers, who is the autonomy lead at Bell Helicopter USA. We've got Don Eli, who is the chief executive officer at Palladium Group International US. We've also got Terrence Maury. He's the founder of Hack Future Lab. And then we've got George Yip, who is a professor at Imperial College of London. And we want to focus this panel today on um, what's really going to be happening here in the future, how we move beyond the pandemic and the lessons we learned from this digital acceleration that we've seen over the last several months and how corporations are going to be incorporating some of the lessons learned. But I want to get started first by looking back on the last seven months, because it certainly has been a really extraordinary one, um, given what we've gone through not just with the public health crisis, but the economic shutdown and the changes that has led to. So, uh, Francis, I'd love to get started with you by talking about how significant the shift has been over the last seven months in terms of how you run your operations and what you've had to tweak and change in order to keep things going in the face of this pandemic. Well, thank you. And certainly, uh, yeah, it's been a massive change. I mean, we're an international company. We operate in 60 countries. And the first, of course, effect immediately was the international travel came to an end. So we had to very quickly uh, reorganize. Uh, one of the trips that was canceled, of course, was the Horasis meeting in Portugal. We were all scheduled to be at. Um, so uh, the first thing was eliminating travel. The second thing was we very quickly decided the best course of action was to have as many people working from home as we could. Uh, so we shifted to a uh, offline or remote um, setting. We pretty quickly found out we didn't have enough VPN lines. That was rapidly corrected. Uh, but I think people adjusted to it very quickly. We were fortunate, you know, being a high tech company that we were able to make those adjustments. Um, and then for the rest of the people we instituted, you know, the temperature checks and and wellness checks uh, for everybody coming in and out of our uh, our factory. So um, we were able to continue operation and can and still continue operation in a pretty much I won't say uninterrupted, but we've we've all kind of adjusted to to talking to people on the video. In fact, we had a meeting yesterday where everybody was in the office, but we had a, a video chat like this anyway because we're just so used to doing it that way. So yeah, we're, we're all getting used to just kind of seeing each other in, in squares, right, on the screen. Yeah. Um, I, I want to bring in our, our two panelists that have now joined us. We've got Sanjay Poonin, who is the Chief Operating Officer at VMware. And then uh, we've also got Joe Landon, who is the Vice President of Lockheed Martin USA, joining us too. And Sanjay, I'm going to bring you right into the conversation because we were just talking about how dramatic the shift has been over the last seven months. You've got a global operation, 33,000 employees is I think what I, uh, the last check I saw. I mean, walk me through your thought process and how you've had to adapt um, over the last six, seven months. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, having us here. Uh, as we thought about the uh, pandemic, I mean, the last time I was on a plane was actually uh, to the World Economic Forum in Davos, uh, in Switzerland in January, and little did I know, a month later, everything would change. We were all crowded, several thousand of us in this small village in Switzerland. Cold. I'm sure several people there had COVID, um, and we didn't even know about it. You know, some people were talking about it. But end of February, I remember as we were preparing for a major sales event where we bring about 10,000, 12,000 of our people to, we're going to do it first in uh, Las Vegas and then in Barcelona and in Singapore. We're going to do it to train our people in. We began to hear this getting worse and worse. And I kept asking my people, uh, is the CDC and the World Health Organization calling this a pandemic as yet? And we began to see cancellation of our employees who didn't want to come to a group event. Now, this is, you know, mid, well before the shutdown. We were one of the first companies that had many of these sort of training events that were going to happen in person to cancel our event and make it all virtual. Uh, we took the step well before we even called a pandemic. And I, never, I look back at that 
Uh, and I don't regret that decision because um, it was the right thing to do. And it reflected to me the first thing that I think is really important of us leaders. We've got to take care of our employees. Um, the health, the profits of our companies will wait. The health and safety of our employees are much more paramount. And when you take care of your employees, you send a signal to your organization of what's important. Uh, you start to develop empathy with them. And they, in turn, if they're healthy, we said the most important thing is the health and safety of your employees and your families, especially the older ones among you. But if you're healthy and safe, you're doing well, we're going to spend the next several months taking care of our customers, even if it's remote. We had been one of the first companies to invest in technologies like Zoom. We stand for, you know, virtualization technology often runs part of the world. VMware does that pretty well. And we turned our attention to customers and it was incredibly uplifting to see the way in which our employees in serving customers developed a, a fabric of satisfaction. We had to, we saw hundreds and thousands of stories of customers where we were helping them in hospitals and pharmacies in schools um, where they were using VMware technology to help better uh, you know, kind of passed through the pandemic. Uh, and that's been kind of the story of the last six, seven months. Yeah, it, it, you know, to your point, it's been, it's put a lot of executives in this unique position where you have to weigh uh, the health concerns and then the business concerns and suddenly everybody is kind of, you know, an expert epidemiologist <laughs> overnight. Um, Joe, let me turn to you on this because, you know, in many ways, it was a very easy transition relatively for tech companies who were kind of in this position to be able to hop on a Zoom call, who were able to be, just take their laptops home and then just seamlessly transition. You're in a space that is, uh, number one, addressing national security, also has to deal with manufacturing. I mean, how did you continue to keep your operations going when you didn't necessarily have that luxury of just saying, everybody just go from home and then we'll regroup that? Right. Uh, is my audio coming through okay? Just it is you. coming through, yes. Okay, great, I think we goodness. figured out some more tech um, issues. Yeah, so, th so thank you. You know, I think at Lucky Martin, uh, you know, as was mentioned, you know, we have uh, served, you know, critical national security customers you know, and other commercial and civil uh agency. So shutting down and working from home, you know, for mo for many of our people was not an option, right? Some of some of our folks could. In fact, you know, we were were somewhere in a very low number of people who were teleworking prior to uh the the COVID epidemic. Uh and then we had we, we did manage to go to a, you know, increase that by a lot. But there's some things that just have to be done uh, in person. We had, you know, in, in uh, March when this started really uh, hitting in the U.S., we had a GPS satellite that was being prepared to launch just a couple months later in the summer. So, um, again, this is critical infrastructure, you know, for the world that we had to keep delivering. Um, so we did a couple things. Uh, one, you know, we instituted new cleaning procedures, uh, again, focus on the safety of, of our employees. So, Assuming that we had to be there, how do we make it safe for folks to be there and, and make it uh, comfortable you know, for, for folks to be uh, at work? We also reduced the concentration of employees in our facilities quite significantly and, and had to you know, physically change the environment you know, really quickly uh, in order to um, make it safe. We also uh, you know, asked our, our folks and gave our employees a lot of leverage in terms of flexibility and how to adapt to this. You know, f uh, folks tried using different work schedules and you know, some people working during the day, during the night, you know, all week long, uh, uh, doing, you know, experimenting with different schedule options. Um, th there were some things that we, we traditionally didn't think could be done remotely that were. So we fly eight deep space missions uh, for NASA, where we actually have a mission control. We, we operate these spacecraft around Jupiter and Mars. Uh, and we, we transitioned to flying those from home. Uh, so folks are logging in from their computers at home, uh, sending commands to Jupiter. Wow, um, that, that's uh, incredible. Yeah, you know, so, so we did manage to do that. Um, but again, you know, we're, we're 110,000 employees and 375 facilities. So it was really um, looking at what the needs of that local uh, team and what those individual teams uh, needed was was first and their, their safety and security. Yeah, you hear that and you think, well, if there was any year to have a pandemic, <laughs> it's in 2020 where there's so much technology available to do right. things remotely. Uh, Don, let me bring you into the conversation because I think at, at the core of what we're trying to address, at least in this panel, is really how do we take all these threads, the lessons we've learned over the last seven months to push it forward for really what is a change in how corporations or how leaders um, look at their business operations. And that's something that you had been looking at even before the pandemic hit. How have you seen some of those themes that you looked into, some of the changes you were anticipating accelerate as a result of what has played out? Yeah, thank you, Akiko. So um, first thing I think is important to talk about is what does the future leader look like? 
and what do we need out of our future leaders? And so from my perspective, really what it is, is it involves a completely different consciousness state and approach to business um, over what has predominated over the last several decades. And what we've had over the last several de decades of corporate management and leadership is a service to self, bottom line, profits over everything. And, you know, we have lots of examples of that. Uh, we have the classic Ford Pinto. We have recent examples, Wells Fargo and Boeing, where deaths and expensive lawsuits are really the only thing that keeps um, these some of the corporations and mentality of profit in check. And so we ended up having a lot of regulations and laws because we can't trust corporations generally to keep the benefit of others to be more important than their financial interests of how can I get something from you to make my numbers kind of service to sell. And so the leaders really, if you look at it, leaders in business have really had two different consciousness states between who they are in their personal lives a lot of times and then who they are when they walk into the business environment where the one in their personal lives can oftentimes there they can be service oriented consideration of others with family friends church community and then they become kind of a different mindset in business where it becomes bottom line dollars first pressures of boards investors and shareholders and the reality is is that if we want corporations to reflect what we want from them in a service to others mentality we cannot be two different people in two different environments we must we must start being the best self in our business environment as we like to think of ourselves in our personal environment so what does that mean what does that look like to be our best and highest self in business well the reality is everything changes from our values to our objectives to our perspectives and then the resulting behaviors we start incenting our employees based on these different values and objectives to and instead of having values and mission statements that essentially sit on a shelf after days of a team workshop, they actually start becoming implemented in the corporate culture by being part of KPIs, metrics, compensation plans, and support infrastructures because they start becoming part of who you are and how you operate, and it stops becoming all about the numbers. So instead of looking at servicing and benefiting others as just a means to your financial numbers end, the service to others becomes the end itself and the financial benefits then ripple effect from them. Instead of people having to quote, sell others, people end up wanting to do business with you. And so as an example, if you'd look at something in your personal life, if your child came home and started talking about how he wanted to come up with a plan to get more money out of his friends so he could go buy a new bike, um, as a parent, you probably sit that child down and start having a conversation about the value of people over money and, and other value systems. Mm -hmm. Well, we need to start being that same person in our business environment as well. And that's how we end up motivating our employees through inspiration of service to others instead of fear based service to self of what does that mean for me or to me? Because mm -hmm. the former is what inspires and fuels innovation far more than the latter. And so how has um, COVID changed this? Well, you know, we end up seeing more different objectives of truth over being right and, and other kinds of values that I can talk about later. But the essential uh, value of COVID has been that it has really helped our leaders kind of remind themselves who they really are because they're forced to spend more time in their personal homes and their personal environments. They have yeah. less to travel both physically mentally and emotionally away from their grounded home place they yeah, tend and, to be and, and it's interesting you you bring that up because uh, you know i was having a conversation i want to say a few months ago where just in having all these zoom calls all the time you start to learn people's kids faces that pop up in the back you kind of get to become a little more familiar and personal with um, some of your coworkers. and Terrence I want to bring you into the conversation because I think some of the things that Don hit on are things you have been looking at um, this this need to um, look at trust over growth and profitability you could argue that conversation was happening even before the coronavirus hit um, when you look at the conversations at the business roundtable and whether uh, values should be put alongside shareholder profitability. Have we already seen that shift among some of the corporations you've been looking at and, and the CEOs? It changes to happen as a breeze. Now it feels like a category five typhoon. We've got blurring of industry lines, economic and geopolitical uncertainty, uh, disruptive technologies and a global pandemic. Uh, trust, I define trust as a, a confident relationship 
in the unknown. Most organizations are one step away from a major trust breach. My research at Hack Future Lab shows that uh, a 10% drop in trust levels between an organization and its customers can translate into up to $30 billion worth of lost revenue. Let's face it, George Orwell would have relished these times. False facts, meme warfare, digital skullduggery. Um, and so I think trust needs to be put front and center in organizations. It needs to be baked into the culture. It needs to be measured in a meaningful way. It needs to be celebrated. And it needs to be prioritized along, alongside growth and alongside profitability. Um, trust is, is absolutely a, an imperative. It's no longer a nice to have. Yeah, I mean, it is it is. It should have been at the center, but it is increasingly at the center. And George, that does also raise a question of there's a number of variables, I think, that have come out of what we have experienced over the last several months. You know, one is for this more personal connection that employees feel the need to have um, with their leaders. But you've also talked about the need to be a little more nimble, having the limited resources, but being able to utilize that. I mean, how does that apply to um, some of the the threads, the lessons that we have heard from our other panelists today? Um, well, we started talking about leadership. So corporate leadership post-COVID really means doing more with less resources, including fewer people. And the central dilemma for corporate leaders has always been that you're one person who needs to motivate an organization of thousands or hundreds of thousands to embrace and implement the strategies that you're leading. Now, of course, it helps to have high IQ, emotional intelligence, EQ, technical competence, knowing about the business and so on. But even armed with those qualities, leaders often uh, fail at the top job, and particularly in the difficult COVID environment, because often it's because they don't know how to get the organization to do what they want to do. What they lack and what successful leaders really embody down to their marrow is a new concept that we call organizational intelligence, <clears throat> OQ, that my um, co-author Nelson Phillips and I have just published in an article in Harvard Business Review. So for us, OQ consists of five competencies. <clears throat> Being able to send messages that reinforce the strategy, fostering an ethos, using action strategy, rebelling from the top, and staging moments of theater. Let me just quickly talk about each one. <clears throat> so first, sending messages that reinforce the strategy, and they also minimize other communication. So strategies are not implemented by CEOs and other top executives, but by the many people who choose on a daily basis whether to take actions that support or undermine the strategies set out by top management. And with COVID, now they're working from home, even more possible for them to ignore you know, the strategy that has been set out from the top. So the key comps, OQ competence is to send messages that reinforce the strategy, the simpler the better, because organization members already suffer from information overload, and more and more of it is coming over the screen. Second, <clears throat> high OQ leaders foster an ethos that supports a specific understanding of who we are as a company. So when leaders move from managing individuals or small groups to leading entire organizations, you need to build a shared uh, understanding. And again, this shared understanding is even more important in a COVID world. So one example, China's Huawei Technologies, all in the news, has become one of the world's most successful telecoms equipment company. And its success stems in no small part from its ethos of the wolf spirit of Huawei, created by its founder right at the start of the company. Thirdly, high OQ leaders use action strategy more than they do consensus building as they pursue strategic goals. Strategy in the middle of the organization is generally about convincing others of the need to change. At the top of the organization, this is often not so much an option. So what I found is that it often makes sense to adopt a stealth strategy rather than a formally declared one and to bring people along as the strategy starts to prove itself. I applied this myself in a coalition of the willing. Fourth, high OQ leaders rebel from the top. So strong leaders usually have strong views about how things should be done, which can lead them to too many fights too early in their careers. You don't want to be like a John Z. DeLorean who fought nearly everything on his way up and then out of general motors. So really effective leaders learn early on to target only the important issues. And with COVID, there are so many issues now. So rebelling from the top means taking on the biggest challenges only when you have the most firepower. Fifth and last, high OQ leaders stage moments of theater to send powerful messages that will be told and retold throughout the organization. So it sort of reverberates. They're out of the ordinary and unexpected, and they're generally low cost, require limited planning. I don't have a COVID example, but an early one is 
When Steve Jobs was shown the first Apple iPod prototype, he told the designers it was too big. The designers objected that they could not make it any smaller. Jobs picked it up and dropped the prototype into an aquarium's tank of water. After the iPod reached the bottom, bubbles floated up. Then Jobs said, those are air bubbles. That means there is space in there. Make it smaller. <laughs> this moment of theater became part of Apple's folklore, epitomizing Jobs' relentless pursuit of perfection. And just think, in COVID, we really need a lot of theater to entertain and motivate people. Thank you. Uh, th that's an interesting analogy. Sanjay, I'm going to bring you in as an executive of one of the larger tech companies. Um, not necessarily expecting the kind of theater we saw from Steve Jobs, but you know, you've heard a number of our panelists talk about the issue of trust, the issue of more a personal approach in sort of pushing profitability to the back. Certainly as a publicly traded company, you can't come out and say that, but I'm just curious how you see the balance hmm. now. Does all of this, the, the leadership changes we're talking about, have to come at the expense of profitability, at least initially? Yeah, thank you, Okiko. I love that story of Steve Jobs. There are so many, I came to the Silicon Valley right out of college to work at Apple, and there are many, many stories that are legendary about the way in which he made things so theatrical and dramatic. I think we're in an age, uh, to your question, of empathy. And empathy uh, does not mean that you have to sacrifice. When I said you know, earlier, we told our employees the profits of VMware will wait. It's not like we have been, you know, it's tougher times, but we've had two decent quarters. In fact, our Q1 was, was, was very strong and our Q2 was good. Um, and so what we found though, and it's a fundamental premise I remember from 23 years ago when I was in business school at Harvard Business School, I read a case study in a book called The Service Profit Chain from a couple of professors there that talked about how to create sustainable shareholder value, especially in service oriented industries. They found that the true measure in research they'd done of profitable companies was not just um, you know, how much product or profit you got from them or customer satisfaction. It was happy employees. And in fact, happy employees serve ha customers who made them happy, who in turn then bought a lot of product that drove your profit. But the core part behind that was an engaged and happy employee. Uh, so, and I think that that's now starting to really dawn, not just in employees themselves, because they have choices. This sort of top down command and control military style of leadership is is gone. It's dinosaur like. And the empathetic leaders who act almost like Nelson Mandela's, uh, like Mother Teresa's, not because they are wimps and they're not got a strong backbone and are pushovers in negotiations. They're strong, but they build empathy. And we think that that's the kind of leadership, a level five leader that actually can inspire people. They create ecosystems. It isn't a winner take all, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's partnerships that win. Uh, they create an engagement uh, model of servant leadership where the most important person is the person who is that that individual contributor at the leaf level of the organization. They invert the pyramid. These are very new principles that the sort of former 1900s, you know, kind of principles of leadership are almost thrown out. of the, And I think we're getting tested at this because for whatever length this pandemic is going to last, and it's been, you know, six, eight months, it may last another 12, 18 months. I don't think it's going to be as long as World War II that lasted six years. But if we're going to build a marathon culture within our employees uh, that sustains themselves through work at home, uh, takes care of not just their physical health, but their mental health, these are the types of values that I think we need to reinforce in our leaders. Yeah, let me pick up on that point, because you talk about the, the happiness of your employees or the well-being of your employees. And I'm curious how you measure that. It, it does feel like now that we have gone so long in this remote work environment, increasingly you've got employees who are asking for more support with childcare, you know, more support with mental health, having worked from home. How have you as a company thought about the need to invest in that part of your employees, looking at this more holistically instead of, are we just making it easier for them to work and are we supporting them from a technical standpoint? Was that to me, Akiko? Yes. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, listen, we, we've we kind of improvised and we're learning this as we go. So if anybody thinks you've got a playbook for this pandemic, they're either lying or, you know, I want to go meet them because we're, we're all learning through this thing. So I'll just give you a few of the things we've done. Um, you know, for one, we began to do very frequent communication schemes with our employees. In the past, we would have done maybe a quarterly town hall. We got everybody together in Palo Alto and Bangalore, our major cities, and we all crowded that. Now we've moved to a lot more half an hour, 25, 30 minute, uh, every week communication type of schemes. 
encouraging our leaders to do in-country Zoom calls. So I will, for example, do a call in Japan just for my several hundred or thousand people in that country in their time zone where 10, 15 minutes I'm sharing things, but then listening to them. Uh, we, we don't have a sort of you know vacation day policy. We have an honor system, so we're not tracking PTO, personal time off. Uh, but we specifically felt in the last six months that we needed to pick a particular day where we said you are you are commanded, so to speak, to take the day off, so to speak. And we we don't want to see a single email from any of you. Uh, and that was forcing people to say, take this day off. And, and uh, it was the Friday, I think, before Labor Day weekend. So in the U.S., people got four days. I think we picked another day earlier in the year. And we'll do that periodically. So there are gestures of this kind that really help your employees, um, you know, sort of make them know that you're walking in their shoes. Uh, and then many other things we could talk about in terms of how they, they deal with their, uh, their children. We have kind of bring your kids to work, bring your pits, uh, pets to Zoom. There's a variety of different things that you can do to make this empathetic for your employees. Uh, you know, design calls. Now, for example, I'll give you the last one, then I'm sure we could go on and on. We, when we do our 30-minute calls, we say the meeting has to end in 25 minutes. Why? Just give the people five minutes break to go to the bathroom or rest. If it's a 60-minute meeting, be done in 55 minutes. Um, uh, don't schedule meetings for the weekends. So it's simple principles like this that really allow us, uh, and it's hard. Listen, I'm a parent of three kids. Uh, my children are, you know, I'm trying to be a parent and a teacher, my wife and I. And it's got to be hard for not just me, but people who are dual parents working, single parents trying to take care of young kids. So we've got to all develop that uh, empathetic DNA a lot more. Joe or Francis, I'd love for you, uh, either one of you, to weigh in here, too. Um, I know when we had a conversation before, you, you talked about sort of weighing what has worked in terms of these additional, I don't know if we should call them services, but but being mindful of where your employees are in this environment. Um, Joe, you want to you wanna weigh in yeah, on what sure. Andre said and, and what you find has worked, at least at Lockheed Martin? Yeah, sure. I'd actually like to start with what hasn't worked. Uh, just building on what, what Sanjay said, a couple you know things that we've tried. Um, you know, we've done virtual happy hours. Uh, I think that not that just sort of uh, uh, emerged organically, but we found they're being scheduled late in the day and people were already on the on Zoom all day long anyway. So it was like, and there was this burden or this expectation that you were joining these things, uh, you know, with their leaders. So that didn't always work out uh, as well as planned. We also found that, um, you know, we're, we're spread out all over, over the country and the world. And before COVID, we did a much better job of respecting time zones. And now all of a sudden, we just don't, uh, you know, so that's a challenge that we're dealing with right now where folks on the East Coast are up late and folks on the West Coast are up early and somehow that just didn't didn't uh, uh, transfer over to COVID world. Um, you know, and, and you know, we, we actually saw productivity increases in, uh, in our teams, but it was because people were working longer, you know, not taking time off uh, uh, because there was nowhere to go or nothing to do. Uh, we haven't quite cracked that nut on how to how to solve that yet. But I think, um, you know, these are some of the challenges as we're seeing and trying to deal with. Francis, you want to you want to jump in here? I mean, Joe kind of hinted on or talked about what hasn't worked. What has worked in the case of um, some of the changes that you've made? Yeah, well, certainly uh, offering our employees more flexibility. Everybody's got their own particular situation. I've got grandchildren. I've got other uh, uh, employees that are caring for elderly parents. Uh, and, and the situation for each of them is, is very unique and you can't just treat everybody the same way and expect that one formula is going to work for everyone. You do have to have that flexibility in there. I will say we, our, our, uh, my uh, boss that I work with joked that our productivity is probably going to double with uh, the re reducing the number of interruptions. Uh, but I will say, you know, having uh, just coming up, I'm going on vacation tomorrow. We had a very difficult time even to figure out what the heck we were going to do on vacation. We were supposed to go to Berlin, and obviously that got canceled. Um, so, um, you know, we're going to go sit on the beach for a week and, and uh, not answer the phone and not do email. And that's, that's going to be our vacation this year. But, yeah, being creative with this has, has really been a challenge. But the main thing is being flexible and being able to – let each uh, having the flexibility that each person can deal with their own particular situation because this uh, pandemic hits us all individually. And yeah, um, not checking easy uh, email. I was going to say easier said than done. We're also accustomed to just having our phones all the time. Yeah, we're um, kind of blowing that. I got a meeting on.
<laughs> uh, we've got just under 10 minutes left. So I, I want to see if we can round this out by, you know, pushing this even more ahead. And, um, you know, Don, Terrence and, and George, as those of you who have been looking at sort of the, the model of what that leadership looks like, um, how do we scale this? We, we've kind of exchanged ideas on, on where you think things should go. Um, how do you make this stick beyond the pandemic? And a larger question I've been wondering a lot about lately is how does this lead to more innovation or a change in thinking within these companies? Don, you want to kick that off? Sure. You know, um, when you talk about changing your focus, you're changing, when I say change your consciousness state, it really is changing kind of how you approach it. Everything about how you walk into the business environment has a uh, a set of values and perspectives that um, are coming from a service to others mentality. And so a lot of this is actually stemming from a lot of the personal development, um, self-help, ego management that people go through on the personal side. And that has ripple effects then into the business environment. And the way that, you know, honestly, I, have a book that's going to come out next month um, on the personal development side. No shameless plug. Sorry, I won't even tell you about it. Um, but taking that and then moving that into the corporate environment is, you know, kind of the managing the corporate culture and conflict is essentially managing the ego and managing, you know, the way we we are our value systems. Um, and, you know, the egoic value system is is very different than what you know, I'm going to say it comes from the heart, comes from the higher self. And, and that's kind of who we are. And, you know, if we want to change the mindset of what we see in corporations like the Ford Pinto, the Wells Fargo, the, you know, Boeing kind of thing, then we have to actually change the mindset because otherwise we continue to um, develop or create, you know, if we're in the deep end, we just create bigger better floaties instead of moving us into the shallow end where that's where we can be our best self. And so what that means is we actually have to look at how we are valuing um, the life circumstances of what happens in the, the business environment, the people, a lot of things that everybody was saying and start putting that into your metrics and how you are actually managing the business. Terrence, you want to weigh in on this? Is there a company that you can point to that you think is really leading on this issue? Look, there are, there are some great companies out there. I'm going to mention Microsoft. It's a, a legacy company celebrating its 47th year, believe it or not. Satya Nadella came in, a really empathetic leader. He's done three years worth of transformation in three months. And look, it's about mastering the new logic of competition. Um, the 20th century was about scaling efficiency. Um, ROI, return on investment. The 21st century is about scaling intelligence. ROI, return on intelligence, return on ideas, return on imagination. Uh, because the leadership model historically is broken. It was about value extraction. Leaders of today and tomorrow who win will focus on value creation at speed and scale. ROI, return on intelligence. Did I get that right? The acronym, right? Um, George, I'm going to give you the last word here. We've got about three minutes left or so in the session, but um, how are you viewing the ability to, to scale all of this? And then also applying what you said through that guideline of how future leaders or how leaders should be uh, moving or uh, leading their companies in the future. Mm -hmm. In terms of scaling, actually, we might want to look at China, which is another stream of my research. I spent many years recently researching innovation in China. And some Chinese companies are now starting to put much more emphasis on managing via data and the Internet, etc., rather than face to face. There's one company I cannot remember the name right now, but actually the boss avoids any meetings with people at all. So at the end of the year, because all the work is done online uh, through their systems, they evaluate people without writing, you, know, you don't have the uh, 360 degree reviews or anything like that. They just looked at the entire electronic record that they've left and they evaluate them that way. So I think we are going to start to see a new way of managing, partly assisted by um, artificial intelligence and you know, all the management systems where, so, where you know, conversely, there may be less face-to-face -face management and it is more done um, through information systems. And of course, 
the younger generations are more and more used to this because that's the kind of interactions that they've had. So I think we, we have this sort of interesting dilemma. At the one, you know, on the one hand, we want to become more personal and engaged. On the other hand, we're now doing more and more management through data, um, through remote meetings and so on. I'll tell you one thing I did myself when I managed in the previous global crisis, 2008, 2009, the head of a very large Dutch business school, I made it much more possible for people a bit lower down to have meetings with me. The way I did it was that I had much shorter meetings. I became known apparently for the seven minute meeting. You could always get a seven minute meeting with me, but if you, you know, if you didn't have a good idea, that was the end of the meeting. And if you had a good idea, you might get 20 minutes. So that's my last thought for you. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, on the one hand, you're talking about going by data and then yet so much of our conversation today about it has been more about the personal approach. What about the speed with which business happens? I mean, we've talked so much. If we're talking about the tech space, really, it really has been about what we've heard over and over in Silicon Valley, which is to move fast and break things. Are we likely to see a bit of a slowdown as a result of the lessons learned over the last six months? And George, that question is to you. Um. I don't, know about, um, I don't know about slowdown because as, as the economies recover, people are, people are going to want to catch up again. Right? So things are going to speed up. And again, I want to turn to China because the big difference between management in China and in the West now is that they do things more quickly. They act more quickly. They make decisions more quickly. They implement more quickly. So although in the West we may want to be uh, warmer towards employees and slow things down, um, Western companies are up against this huge juggernaut of Chinese companies who are moving faster and faster. I, I'll finish with a quote going back to Huawei. The uh, CEO of Huawei likes to say something like, Huawei employees are destined to work harder than anybody else and to suffer for a lifetime. That is their recruiting slogan. So that's what you're up against. Okay, perfect. Uh, with 10 seconds left here. Uh, thank you so much for all, all of you uh, for joining us. Uh, George, Sanjay, Joe, Don, Francis, and Terrence. It's been great to have this conversation. And thank you, those of you in the audience for joining us today. Thank yes, you. thank you. What a delightful thank panel. It was very nice. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.